Plan ahead this Valentine's Day with 1-800-Flowers.com. From first dibs on great deals to the best selection of Valentine's Day roses and guaranteed delivery. Don't wait to wow. Right now, 1-800-Flowers is offering 24 assorted roses for $39.99. Or upgrade to 24 red roses for $10 more. Get right to the romance this Valentine's and find the way to wow with 1-800-Flowers.com. To order, go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. guys and welcome back to what's up doc the documentary review podcast i am your host Gemma delaney and today we are talking about la 92 remember guys if you want to give us a follow we are on all forms of social media we are at what's up doc podcast that's on instagram and on facebook and on twitter we are at what's up doc pod um so like i said guys we are talking about la 92 today this documentary was released back in 2017 and it was directed by tj martin and daniel lindsley Uh, they are the masterminds behind best documentary feature of 2011 undefeated another cracker you can give that a watch as well um so look la 92 um again i always kind of say because I'm based in Ireland and I think a lot of my listenership is as well, you might not be aware of the history in America. And LA 92 is, re- it revisits the 1992 LA riots that erupted in the wake of the verdict of the Rodney King trial. Um, and, you know, obviously history, it has a habit of repeating itself. And, you know, certainly where racial prejudice, racial segregation and, you know, a system just geared towards and uh, built by white privilege is concerned. So I'm not going to lie. I have seen this like five million times. I, 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 this is a cracker. I really like this one. Um, but in terms of my prior knowledge, um, b- before I watched it the first time, I don't think I really had any. Um, this as well, if you were following our um, A to Z of true crime recommendations on Netflix, this was on that. Um, and if you want to revisit it or if you didn't follow it first time around, it's you can find it in our Instagram highlights. It's the A to Z of everything that you must watch true crime related on, on Netflix. Um, but look, if I'm really, truly honest, prior to watching this documentary for the first time, uh, because like I said, I've watched it several times since, um, I didn't really have any in-depth knowledge of the rights other than I knew they existed, you know. Um, so, yeah, like everyone, I, you know, I knew the name Rodney King, but I hadn't educated myself on his individual case, you know. Um, so I wasn't sure what to expect, to be honest, but I don't think, no, I absolutely did not expect what I got uh, first time I saw this and what I get, I suppose, every time I watch this, um, like an education, most definitely. Uh, and what I mean by that is that LA 92 has this beautiful, almost completely unique way of storytelling, because while the documentary is, you know, it's it's a, a documentary telling telling a story, obviously, but It is solely done through archive footage. The only exception to that is text on the screen, maybe explaining what it is that you're seeing. Um, So solely done through archive footage from the time um, with no one interjecting from the present day. So there's nobody kind of, you know, present day kind of going, this is what happened then. There's no look back. It's just, it's in the moment. Um, And I suppose what it does then is because of that, it completely pulls you back in time. You know, it's fly on the wall style. Um, it's as if you're viewing the most destructive riot in US history in real time. That's what it feels like. It feels like you're there on the ground. Um, so the documentary itself, it begins with footage of the 1965 Watts riots. I'm not going to go into it. Guys, Google it if you're not aware of what they are. But it's, it's you know, 
in the briefest of descriptions, it's an eerily similar incident with eerily similar consequences. Uh, It then jumps forward to the 1978 promotion of Daryl Gates to the head of the LAPD. And Daryl is a a walking cunt, quite honestly. There's no no other way way to describe him. Uh, He's a white man with, you know, Jim Crow notions. And he's a fan of excessive force and, you know, creating polarization. And he does create polarization. Um, more so than it already is, obviously. But then it jumps to the killing of a 15-year-old black girl, uh, Latasha Harlins, and then finally onto Rodney King. So Rodney King, look, if you're unaware, he was an average 25-year-old uh, black man. He was married and he had two stepchildren. Until on the 3rd of March 1991, Rodney tried to evade the police who suspected he had been drink driving and he had been drink driving, okay? Um, so he was, he, he tried to outrun them. He was taken out of his car by four LAPD officers who bet him. They bet him 56 times, four on one. And used a 50,000 volt stun gun on him. A local man saw the attack taking place, had a video camera, grabbed it and recorded the whole thing. Uh, The actual footage in its entirety is shown in LA 92. Um, And look, it's as emotive and harrowing as you can imagine and as we've you know, come to see. I mean, we see videos all the time now. Um, The documentary then cuts to Rodney post-attack at a press conference. Um, He's in a wheelchair. He, you know, he looks shit. Like, let's be honest. He has 11 skull fractures, I think. Don't quote me on that. His eye socket has been pulverized and needs reconstructive, uh, reconstructive talk, Gemma words, reconstructive surgery. His leg is broken. Um, and slightly bizarrely, now that I think of it, um, although I suppose it's of, of the time, I guess, his white lawyer stresses that they don't want to turn this into a racial thing. But um, yeah, it's just kind of fucking bizarre, like talking for him. But then I guess what that does is it creates this really nice segue to the next piece. The police radio recordings okay so like I said they're saying they don't want to make it a racial thing and the LAPD are going look totally wasn't a racial thing we were just doing our jobs he was resisting arrest and so we hear that the police radio recordings pick up the four officers referring to Rodney after the attack as a gorilla and they say it was like something out of gorillas in the mist They say he was a lizard, that the lizard, you know, crawled back from where he came and laughing about the incident, basically laughing about, you know, the fact that they bet the absolute living shite out of him. Um, Yeah, it then shows the LA, the the head of the LAPD, uh, Daryl Gates, who I've already mentioned. (laughs) Nice guy. Uh, He's been challenged by local council members kind of, you know, they're they're basically saying to him, like, this recording indicates that there is an acceptance of uh, racist language in the LAPD and, you know, that it's okay to speak this way because they're, they're speaking this way so naturally. Um, yeah, and, like, his reaction is just, like just comes across like such an arrogant prick. He really, really does. Um, That's all I can say, honestly. But then the footage, the archive footage shows these community meetings. It shows rallies. It shows the local black people sharing their own experiences with police brutality. And the pace of the documentary itself, it really quickens because, you know, there's this building tension 
Um, so it, it does pace, the, the pace kind of quickens up at this point. But then what's really kind of poignant as well is interlaced with that, there's, you know, they're talking to the black public and they're kind of going like, you know, we really feel it's different this time, you know. And why? Sure, because it's been caught on camera, of course, you know. And you just, well, I, I can only speak for myself, but watching it just feel, you know, felt this like overwhelming sadness because it's always recorded nowadays. And, you know, you're looking back at them in 1991 and they think this is going to make a difference. And obviously we have the benefit of hindsight and we know that it won't and that it doesn't. And it's just, yeah, it's just really, you know, it's poignant, I suppose. Um, then what happens and again remember this is all being told through the footage there's no narration there's no like I said except for maybe occasionally some text popping up on the screen so mere days later 15 year old Latasha Harlins is shot by a grocery store owner in the back of the head she claims that Latasha was trying to steal orange juice. Um, and Latasha was an honor roll student. Um, the clerk is found guilty. The recommended sentence for, I think it's voluntary manslaughter, it's called. Uh, the recommended sentence is uh, 16 years. She gets a fine and community service. Bearing in mind she's been found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. So she gets a fine and community service. She doesn't spend a day in jail. Um, and again the archive footage shows the crowd's reaction. So again you can see and you can feel the tension rising. As if you're there as all of this is occurring in real time. So finally... Like you can see it's building, it's building up, it's showing all of the things that kind of have to line up for the shit to hit the fan, you know. So they finally get to Rodney King's trial. Um, I've seen this in other documentaries before. I can't think off the top of my head which they are, but I know I have seen it done where that in America you can apply to get a change of venue because, you know, particularly like in a high profile case, I feel like was it the totally on the the wing now was it the central park five that also had a change of venue don't quote me on that i think it was but i've seen it in other cases so basically if there's big cases if they've got a lot of media attention uh, if they feel that you know the people involved won't get a fair trial that they'll be tainted by the media attention they'll apply to have a change of venue and they do this in the rodney king trial because obviously this has been a very very you know contentious issue in the press since his attack um, and they are granted a change of venue so as not to influence any potential jurors by the media coverage, or at least that's what they say. I suspect these change in venues are actually done to, you know, improve their chances of getting away with it. Uh, it's moved to a predominantly white area of LA. Very fucking convenient. Um, and then, look, I, again, I'm I'm jumping through it here, but I don't want to give the whole game away. You, you'll see it when you watch it. You know, we fast forward then to the day of the verdict and the archive footage shows, you know, the public and the news reporters and they're nervous and they're on edge. And, you know, you can see the you know, news reporters kind of, you know, doing the sound checks and, you know, checking their, I won't say scripts, but you know what I mean, over and over again. And you just see the public and the heads in the hands and wringing the hands. And, you know, um, it is, yeah, you can, it's palpable, the tension. And the four officers look are, as we know, found not guilty. And as the verdict is read in this documentary, uh, the footage that's shown, the archive footage, it shows the black members of the public, the reaction, you know, to that verdict as they watched it on telly or listened to it on the radio. And it shows, you know, it shows this man sitting and just a single tear rolling down his cheek. It shows another man jumping up out of his seat and he like, you know, kicks the ground and throws his hat down on the ground. and um. You know, 
we you just see them overcome with emotion at the fucking unfairness of it all because like if they couldn't get justice would have been caught on camera what what needs to happen you know um and so you know you see then shows the crowd outside the courtroom and it shows the tensions building and spilling over between the you know black protesters that have come and then you know some of the white supporters of the cops um and you know shouting slurs racial slurs at each other and look it just very very quickly obviously escalates into you know the now world famous LA riots of 1992 um the footage then of the riots themselves like it's just like I said, what I love about it is you feel like you're there. You feel on edge. You feel like it's taken place. It shows, you know, people setting fire to the dry palm trees. Because again, while all this is going on, you know, all the things that build up to, that led to this kind of overflowing of feelings. Obviously, Rodney King and obviously Letitia Harlings and all that. But as well, you know, at the start of the documentary, it talks about like how it's one of the hottest summers on record. It talks about how the um, the they've reduced the amount of water that households can use. So, you know, it's the earth is barren. People are thirsty. They're, you know, irritated. Um, and yet yeah, it just shows people setting fire to these dry palm trees and the police are just standing back. They're so fucking overwhelmed by the crowd that have poured onto the streets as a result of the verdict. It shows, you know, just looting. It shows police cars been flipped over and torched. It shows, you know, the burning the buildings to the ground after looting them. It shows them just grabbing anything they can use as a projectile and fucking it through windows. And God help anyone who's in their path. Um, there's this scene and it's just, it's so poignant. It's so, it's hard to watch. But then you just can't blame them either. It shows them at this intersection in in uh, LA. The name eludes me at the moment where it is. And it's a very well known one I should know. But um, what they're doing is they're standing out in the streets. Forcing white motorists to stop. Or run over them one or the other. Which of course they're stopping. And what they're doing is. the that They're pulling the white motorists from the cars. Beating the absolute living shit out of them um like they don't stop on them until it appears that they're dead they're not moving they're not responsive and they're shouting like you know how do you like it see how you like it you know it's they're trying to like obviously just their emotions are everywhere and you can't fucking blame them but just you know this is the only way they know how to articulate it. We'll do it to you. See how you like it. And you just, like I said, you can't blame them. The pain is visceral, like visceral. Um, and there's a a black pastor on the street and he's just, he's not trying to intervene around them, but he's just got his hands up in the air and you can't hear what he's saying. I, I, I guess he's saying something from the Bible or, or trying to calm the situation or whatever but it's just um kind of reminds me of bloody sunday i suppose when you're looking at irish history and yeah you can you can feel the pain you know and you can see the pain and then you see like i said the police officers they're not even trying to interject there's just no point that you know that they have absolutely no sway or power over this crowd the anger and the pain is all consuming and you just better get out of their fucking way you know um and then look the government the government um they're just as you can imagine they're just portrayed in this and i can only imagine it was the case they're just seen as a bunch of complete fucking idiots with a complete lack of understanding for the magnitude of the situation and what the correct path is to calm the situation you know they bring in they declare a state of emergency they bring in the fucking army they bring in tanks you know all the wrong things um and then there's this lovely bit in it as well where you know to calm the situation they actually get Rodney King to speak and it's that famous uh speech of his it's so simple but it's one that's quoted over and over again and he's just like 
trying to hold the tears back and he's just going can't we all just get along and he just keeps saying it over and over again um but yeah like watching it it's just it, it could be today you know and I suppose it is in some ways you know it is um my absolute favorite thing about this documentary and there are many but my absolute favorite thing about this documentary is how the directors bookend the piece with the same footage I'm not going to tell you what that is watch it you need to see and it it kind of reminded me of do you remember when Trump was elected and there was this video that went viral um, in my day, back in my day, and the footage that's shown, it's very much like that. It's, oh, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. It's so emotive. It's so tough to watch. And it ends then after that series of footage. Like I said, that's kind of bookends both parts of the documentary. It ends with this reporter from, like I said, I mentioned it back at the start of the documentary, uh, this reporter from the Watts riot, uh, which took place back in the, the 60s. And like I said, that was a very similar kind of situation to Rodney King and I suppose a very similar situation to what's going on at the moment um, with George Floyd. But yeah, it's this reporter on a black and white newsreel piece talking post the Watts riots and he's you know looking into the camera and saying that if the American government don't do something to really tackle and address the race issue um, and the racial injustice in America uh, once and for all God knows how bad or how much worse this is going to get in the future and like I said watching it at a time like now where we have all this going on again you know um yeah it's just try and watch this documentary without fucking getting choked up I dare you um you're made of stone if you don't feel so fucking incensed after watching this documentary it is yeah it's just it's obviously very 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 of the moment but like I said I've seen this several times and it chokes me up every time but it's it's because it's the story it's raw and it's it's also the directors they just do a beautiful job of what you think wouldn't work you know 100% archive footage you would imagine that would be very hard to pull you into a storytelling um or pull you into the storytelling I should say and and get you know get you engaged and and you know make you want to stay there for the hour and I think it's an hour and 40 minutes something like that but it does it really fucking does um so look LA92 it's on Netflix and it is in my opinion an absolute masterpiece in storytelling go watch it tonight it's a great one so guys that is it we have come to the end of our episode of what's up uh, doc look we are the documentary review podcast i am your host Gemma delaney and as always i always say if you want to support us it's only me on my own some all you need to do is give us a like give us a follow give us a share give us a review on apple podcasts we would really 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 appreciate it guys until next time good luck Good night and God bless. If you love to be remembered as the person who gives the best birthday gifts, I'm here to tell you that 1-800-Flowers.com is your ultimate birthday gifting destination. 1-800-Flowers has thoughtful and artfully created options that are guaranteed to deliver the best birthday surprise. Shop thousands of unique gifts at 1-800-Flowers.com for exclusive offers and great values. To order today, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in.